So I want to return to the question of what the comparison between solids and liquids is, and we talked about this earlier too. And indeed, one can put these two things side by side and ask a simple question about solids and fluids. So if you look at solids, we know, and this is again high school physics that you probably remember, that elasticity of a solid is linearly, is, is measured by a proportionality constant. You're familiar with Young's modulus, E, and it relates the stress with the strain. What is stress? Stress is nothing but the term F by A. And strain is the relative deformation. If you recall, when you have a spring with a mass, then the strain is simply the change in length upon the length, and stress is force acting per unit area. What about fluids? So in fluids, we recall that viscosity is not related to strain, but strain rate. And this is something important, right? In other words, the rate of change of deformation is what we are measuring as a proportionality constant with viscosity, right? So this in some sense is the contrast between Newton's law of viscosity and the Young's modulus, which relates stress with strain for solids. Indeed, uh, the reason for bringing up Newton's law is that if you plot a shear rate or strain rate on the x-axis and shear stress or stress on the y-axis, then the proportionality constant eta is nothing but the slope of this line. Yeah. However, there are fluids that deviate from this and um, either the increasing shear rate leads to a very rapid and then saturating value of shear stress or it leads to a slow one and depending on that they are either referred to as shear thinning or shear thickening and these indeed are deviations from Newton's law of viscosity and therefore get referred to as non-Newtonian fluids. So this is the average behavior, the standard behavior and these deviations are then used to define what are called non-Newtonian fluids. Right? Just to remind ourselves, um, eta is F by A upon delta V by delta Z. In other words, the stress upon the shear gradient this, or the velocity gradient or shear rate. Okay. So, I'm going to sort of come back to this question of non-Newtonian fluids later and ask if the material is Newtonian, if it is behaving according to the standard laws, then how do we measure viscosity? This is a very exciting question because after all the theories of the world are very nice. If we cannot, however, test them and measure them, then how do we know? And one instrument, a very simple, conceptually simple instrument that is used to measure viscosity is called a ball drop viscometer and the method is called ball drop viscometry. As the name suggests, it involves dropping a ball yeah, through a long column <clears throat> of the fluid. So this is your sort of fluid column here. 
and when you leave a ball at the point above the fluid right this one here it's expected to fall into the fluid it's normal expectation right so as the ball falls through the fluid as we know from our common experience it will increase initially in velocity and then reach a terminal velocity meaning to say a constant velocity where velocity does not change anymore this is also if you remember your common experience with dropping a ball or throwing a ball into the air and it falling down again because gravity remember is ubiquitous on planet earth so if we draw a free body diagram which means we ask what all are the forces acting on the ball then we expect that the ball of radius r will experience a buoyant force that is fd and a drag force fd opposing the motion motion remember is this way the ball is falling correct and over time eventually it will hit bottom obviously for this experiment to work we have to take a ball that is heavy enough at the same time what is taking it down this is also fairly obvious to us it is the gravitational force which then we call fg and the motion is at a velocity so we have three forces acting on our ball force due to gravity buoyant force or archimedes force remember archimedes principle and drag force right for those of you who don't remember archimedes principle please go back and look this is brilliant ancient wisdom and by ancient wisdom i mean the laws that ancient wisdom gave us can be written down in the simple form of an equation and that simple equation it doesn't matter whether you are greek archimedes was greek or hindu or indian or indus valley civilization or egyptian or arabic mathematician or scholar in italy in galileo's laboratory the laws are still universal this is the beauty of science isn't it so the gravitational force is just simply f is equal to mg m is your mass mass of the object and g is the gravitational acceleration mass itself as you recall can be written in terms of the density times the volume so you have this first term fg is the product of the density of the solid the volume of the object and the gravitational acceleration what about the drag force what i called archimedes i'm sorry the stokes force so we call it stokes force partly because george stokes has worked the rise to this equation for a spherical object we can indeed say that the drag force is equal to 6 pi theta r yeah and finally archimedes's force the buoyant force this is the reason why we float right those of you who like swimming you may go to a swimming pool or you take a ball and throw it on top of water um uh, not a cricket ball that will sink um but a basketball or a volleyball or even simpler child's plastic ball filled with air it will float and the reason why it floats or sinks like the cricket ball is because of this equation number 3 which is that the buoyant force is equal to the density of the fluid times the volume displaced times the gravitational acceleration you remember archimedes principle was based on the volume displaced right and the fact that it depended on the density of the material which he used to decide whether the crown of the king of 
Sicily was made of gold or had any additives. So, just to go over our terms, G is gravitational acceleration, V object is the volume of the object, V displaced is the volume of the displaced um, fluid, uh, rho fluid, density of the fluid, G is acceleration. This has come twice, we can get rid of it. And rho is the density of the solid, right? So when we go ahead, we can write down a force balance at terminal velocity. What this means is just simply that at the time of terminal velocity, the downward forces and the upward forces are balanced. We'll call this force upwards, force downwards. And therefore, we can equate them. Remember, these are all the upward forces, the drag and buoyant force. And this is the only downward force, but sufficient to take it down. The gravitational force. Now, substituting equations 1, 2, 3 into this equation, we get 6 pi eta r v f d. Buoyant force being rho fluid times gravitational acceleration times V displaced. And the gravitational force being rho solid times V object times G. We simplify by assuming that the volume displaced is corresponding to the volume of the object. In that case, when we solve for the velocity term, which is what we are interested in, namely this one here, then we get a term for the terminal velocity. This terminal velocity then becomes the difference between the object density and the fluid density. As you know, again, familiar to you perhaps, times the gravitational acceleration g times the object upon 6 pi eta r. Now, remember we wanted to estimate viscosity, so we rearrange terms and we get this. We get eta is equal to 2 by 9 into delta rho, the difference between the object and the fluid viscosity, the log density, into g into r square upon terminal velocity. Important to note that at this point, we can measure experimentally or know in advance the density of the object. Let's say we take a steel ball, this is well known. We know the density of the fluid because we can weight, measure weight per unit volume. That's what density means. We know gravitational acceleration thanks to almost 200 years of physics. We know the size of the object that gives us a r square. And doing the experiment, we can estimate the terminal velocity, which means after we do the experiment and we know these parameters, we can find out the viscosity of the fluid. Wonderful, correct? A simple, such a simple experiment. Just let a ball fall in a long column of fluid, let it reach its terminal velocity, measure the velocity, substitute the values, and you get viscosity. So let's ask the next question, which is can we use this to measure cytoplasmic viscosity? And again, I have to ask you to be a little patient and we'll come back to it after we have covered some more concepts. Mm -hmm.